Right, welcome back. We'll resume for the uh, afternoon. Uh, every so often in the commercial world, uh, practices which have been perhaps quite common are put under the spotlight and recognised as unacceptable. Uh, when I was practising from Brick Court Chambers, uh, it was the Lloyd's Market that had their practices put under the spotlight. And I suspect that many who had been involved in them hadn't considered that they were doing anything wrong at all. I wonder whether that applies to what we're going to hear about now. Uh, thank you very much, Lord Phillips, for um, that introduction and uh, agreeing to chair today's conference. And thank you very much to uh, all of you for coming along uh, to mark 10 years since the um, start of the credit cr uh, crunch. Um, the topic I'm going to deal with uh, arises from uh, the PAG and RBS litigation, which reached the Court of Appeal and was heard over eight days before the master rolls uh, earlier this year. Uh, I'm going to deal with the implied representation case, um, as it was heard by their lordships, arising out of the uh, LIBOR uh, issues, and Ben Woolgar is going to deal with the swaps mis-selling, which was reviewed by the Court of Appeal in that case. So you've got, the, um, you've got brains and brawn in this session, although, as the more astute amongst you will have noticed, not in that order. <laughs> By way of background, uh, PAG was a mid-sized property development company operating in the north of England, primarily with finance from RBS. RBS sold PAG for swaps or derivatives, each of which was indexed to LIBOR. As, al as almost all swaps did, the swaps moved against PAG when interest rates crashed in late 2008. PAG was subsequently placed into RBS's global restructuring group, which attracted considerable publicity after the Tomlinson report and subsequent Clifford Chance review. But PAG, unlike many GRG companies, escaped insolvency. PAG brought claims against RBS under three general headings, that the swaps had been missold to it, those are the swaps claims, that the bank had made an implied fraudulent misrepresentation concerning LIBOR, the LIBOR claim, and that uh, PAG's transfer into GRG was unlawful. That was the GRG claim. Uh, and we are going to deal with the first two of those claims. First, looking at LIBOR and the rules, LIBOR has been said to be the world's most important number. Uh, my 15-year-old son, when he was idly flicking through these notes when they were on the kitchen table last weekend, was a bit surprised by that and said, gosh, Dad, it must be important. It's even more important than the number for your local Indian takeaway that you s scramble around furiously for twice a week. So with that um, sort of high praise, li LIBOR uh, governs the vast majority of the derivatives transacted um, in the world. There are literally trillions of dollars of notional amounts um, under those uh, contracts which are governed by this particular benchmark. LIBOR itself is, is uh, a trimmed arithmetic mean of the submissions of 16 LIBOR panel banks, of which RBS was one, which means that the, each panel bank puts in submissions uh, in accordance with the BBA definition, which we'll come to on each day for all the various currencies and tenors um, th th that are um, comprised within LIBOR, and the bottom four and top four submissions are excluded and then the remaining eight are averaged out to get the LIBOR rate for each of the various currencies and tenors. The uh, LIBOR is set according to the BBA, or British Bankers Association definition, which is the rate at which an individual contributor bank could borrow funds were it to do so by asking for and then accepting interbank offers in reasonable market size just prior to 11 o'clock uh, London time. Uh, as I suspect most of you know, uh, as part of the financial um, crisis, uh, issues regarding LIBOR emerged. Um, they were reported in a um, number of the uh, financial journals and press. You can see the reference there to a Financial Times article in 2012. Since 2012, there have been a, a, a number of uh, regulatory inquiries and um, reports into the uh, LIBOR manipulation and LIBOR fixing leading to a series of um, fines uh, for a number of the panel banks, and we've set those out there. There have also been European Commission cartel investigations and criminal prosecutions in uh, the US, UK, Germany, and Japan. That is a table which was before the Court of Appeal this, the, uh, in the PAG case, 
which sets out the extent of the regulatory findings in relation to panel banks to do with LIBOR. You can see there the banks that are involved and the various uh, LIBORs that um, have been the subject of uh, findings by the regulators. Moving on to the civil claims uh, concerning LIBOR, um, the question is, well, what has this got to do with a property company in the north of England? Uh, the answer is that it's an application of a straightforward cause of action for fraudulent misrepresentation. That breaks down into four uh, key ingredients. First, were there any actionable representations? Secondly, if there were, were they false? Thirdly, were they fraudulent? And fourth, were they relied upon by the representee? The uh, PAG RBS trial, first instance trial, took place in 2016. It was transferred by Sir Terence Etherton, as he then was, into the newly created financial list, and it was heard over the summer of 2016 uh, in front of Mrs Justice Asplin, as she then was, uh, and she, um, as, you, as you can see from this slide, she held that none of the libel representations were made, so there were no actionable representations in the first place. If there had been, they were false only to the extent of RBS's admitted misconduct in Swiss franc and Japanese yen LIBOR, not US dollar or pound sterling LIBOR. If they were false, they were not fraudulent, and PAG had not relied upon them. So, unsurprisingly, that claim failed. The LIBOR representations themselves, which were the subject of that trial, were taken from the uh, Graisley formulation, which I put up uh, on the page there, I put them up there as the draftsman of them, having a certain residual pride of, of authorship. The Court of Appeal felt they were too intricate and helpfully reformulated the misrepresentation or the representations, uh, as we shall see in the next slide. In front of the Court of Appeal this year, the uh, question was well, the first question was there sufficient conduct to, gr to ground any sort of implied representation? The Court of Appeal started by reformulating the representations themselves, and they uh, concluded as follows. The most feasible formulation seems to us to be that RBS was representing that. At the date of the swaps, RBS was not itself seeking to manipulate LIBOR and did not intend to do so in the future. The uh, Court of Appeal uh, went through... Um, in the Court of Appeal's reasoning in finding that there was at least this actionable um, or potentially actionable representation, the Court of Appeal looked at uh, something called the helpful test drawn from a case called Geist and Fife's um, in the 1990s uh, in which Mr Justice Coleman gave the judgment. And it, it's actually, it, it, it's, it's worth looking at, at that analysis and what Mr Justice Coleman there said because it, that the helpful test has not perhaps had the attention that it deserved, certainly until more recently. The Court of Appeal identified Mr Justice Coleman's helpful test and uh, where Mr Justice Coleman had, had, had put it ultimately as follows, in evaluating the effect of the uh, representor's conduct, a helpful test is whether, having regard to the uh, representor's conduct in such circumstances, a reasonable potential representee would naturally assume that the true state of facts did not exist and that had it existed, he would in all the circumstances necessarily have been informed of it. And as I said, that was in, in uh, the late 1990s. The Court of Appeal then went to the well-known um, formulation uh, by Mr. Justice, uh, the late Mr. Justice Toulson in IFE Fund and Goldman Sachs, uh, where he formulated the test for implied representations as follows. In determining what, if any, implied representation has been made, the court has to perform a similar task, except that it has to consider what a reasonable person would have inferred was being implicitly represented by the representor's words and conduct in their context. The court bill then went on to um, cite with approval Mr Justice Christopher Clark, as he then was in his uh, decision in Raffison uh, and RBS, where Mr. Justice Christopher Clark had um, endorsed the helpful test, which I've um, set out uh, already. They then went on, the Court of Appeal, to look at the UBS and KWL case, which you'll hear about um, later, in which, in 2014, in which Mr. Justice Mails, as he then was, held, it, it held that in setting up um, some uh, intermediate transactions to do with a, 
single tranche um, CDO deal, UBS had impliedly represented that the transaction, that there was no knowledge of, of dishonesty concerning the counterparty and that there was no uh, knowledge of taint of the transaction. So Mr. Justice Mayles implied a, a couple of representations really that went to the integrity or probity of the counterparty or transaction. And Mr. Justice Mayles uh, in, it followed Christopher Clark Jay's uh, endorsement of the helpful test. And then in PAC, the Court of Appeal expressly approved Mr. Justice Coleman's test. And they said this, we do think it is a helpful test in relation to the existence of an implied representation to consider whether a reasonable representee would naturally assume that the true state of the facts did not exist and that if it did, he would necessarily have been informed of it. So that, that was the Court of Appeal's reasoning in PAG, which led them to conclude that RBS did make some representation, which they formulated in the way that I've set out, uh, and they... Uh, went on to say that such a comparatively elementary representation would probably be inferred from a mere proposal of the swap transaction. But we need not go as far as that on the facts of this case in the light of the lengthy previous d discussions. The Court Appeal went on to cite with approval uh, Mr Justice Males's analysis in the UBS and KWL case. So, to go back to the four points... Uh, the, first, the first of those, uh, namely, is there a potentially actionable uh, representation as to LIBOR, um, was upheld by the Court of Appeal in the PAG case. The Court of Appeal then went on to consider in PAG, oh, sorry, the scope of that representation, because it was relevant in, in the PAG and RBS case as to whether that representation as to LIBOR um, extended to all LIBOR currencies and tenors, or whether it was limited only to the um, currency uh, in which the particular PAG swap was governed. And that was relevant because the regulators in relation to RBS had only positively found that there was um, manipulation of Swiss franc and Japanese yen and had not made any finding that there was any manipulation of pound sterling LIBOR. Uh, in the Graisley case, Mr. Justice Flo, at a pre-trial stage, had, had, had um, observed that, in his view, it was a wholly artificial exercise to seek to subdivide up the various libel fixings or manipulations into separate currencies. That was really on the basis of, of the potential for cross-contamination and the fact that LIBOR is, is in effect set and submitted by all the panel banks in the same way. The Court of Appeal um, disagreed with that approach and held that because the swap contract in PAG was only referable to pound sterling LIBOR, the implied representation as to manipulation must be confined to that particular LIBOR. Um, and as a result, the claim against RBS, which had only been found to manipulate um, uh, Swiss franc and Japanese yen LIBOR, failed. The Supreme Court has recently refused permission to appeal in PAG, and so the Court of Appeal decision represents the current state of the law as to the nature and scope of any implied representation. The second issue in a misrepresentation case such as this is obviously whether the representations were false. I've set out on the slide some of the uh, key points in, in PAG. Um, the, uh, the judge uh, um, held that there was no um, falsity in relation to um, pound sterling. The Court of Appeal uh, upheld the trial judge and deferred to her, um, observing that they weren't really in a position to um, really go behind uh, her, the, the, her various findings. It, it's perhaps worth noting that w given the importance that was attached to regulatory findings by the court in PAG, where those findings do record manipulation of the relevant LIBOR currency, a panel bank may well struggle to deny the falsity of that implied representation. The third of the four issues that arose in PAG on the misrep case was the question of whether the representation, had it been um, made and found to be false, what had been made fraudulently by RBS, which is um, an interesting uh, feature. Uh, it's, uh, probably I need to get out more, but the, the, the uh, fraud uh, um, question in PAG did raise some interesting points. You can see what the Court of Appeal said in PAG about this issue. Uh, 
which I've um, put up on the, on the board there. Um, the, 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 the Court of Appeal did not go on to consider the question of fraud, having found against PAG on the appeal on the grounds of falsity. And they said this, there is therefore no need to consider whether the judge's conclusion that fraud had not been proved is correct. If we had concluded that the implied representation was false, it would be necessary to decide how the normal rule that for a finding of fraud, the representor must have intended to make a representation he knew to be false, can apply to an implied representation when the implication is not present to the representor's mind. It may be the case that an implied representation of this kind can never or quite rarely be fraudulent. On the other hand, recent decisions about dishonesty, such as Barlow, Klaus and Eurotrust, and Ivy and Genting Casinos, may be relevant. It is unnecessary for us to resolve that question in this case. And the, although the Court of Appeal um, left the matter open, they were obviously giving some clues as to some of the um, submissions that may well be relevant to, to, this, to this issue. Uh, I'm going to borrow, uh, you, you, you're probably aware of the, um, what the Court of Appeal were there referring to, namely the way in which the test for dishonesty has mutated over recent times in, in the criminal context and then more latterly um, by transposition in, in civil litigation. The um, Lord Justice Jackson summarised the evolution of um, the dishonesty test well in a recent case called the, uh, the, well, the Solicitor's Regulation Authority and Wingate, and I'm going to borrow a bit from his analysis. He refers to the Gauche case in the Court of Appeal, the criminal case in the 1980s, where they, where they um, established a, t a twin-pronged test for dishonesty under the Theft Act, namely, the, namely first an objective um, test, which is that what the defendant did was held to be dishonest by ordinary <laughs> reasonable standards, but secondly, that assuming it was dishonest by those objective standards, the, uh, did the defendant himself subjectively realise that what he was doing was by those standards dishonest? So that was the, the twin, the, the two-limb test, which appeared to be uh, adopted in the civil context in Twin Sector and Yardley by the House of Lords in 2002. But then in Barlow, Klaus and Eurotrust in, in 2006, the Privy Council reinterpreted the Twin Sector case in such a way as to eliminate the second element from the definition of dishonesty, at least in civil proceedings. So you, you are coming back towards an objective test, whatever that may mean, for dishonesty in the civil context. And then importantly, um, the Supreme Court earlier this year disapproved the Court of Appeals decision in Gauche, and that was in the Ivy and Genting Casinos um, uh, case, and they reviewed dishonesty more generally, both in the criminal and also in the civil context. And it's worth, I think, um, looking at what Lord Hughes said. And I'll just finish by hit some observations of his um, in the um, IV case. He said this, when dishonesty, and, and this was in a civil context, when dishonesty is in question, the fact-finding tribunal must first ascertain subjectively the actual state of the individual's knowledge or belief as to the facts. The reasonableness or otherwise of his belief is a matter of evidence, often in practice determinative, going to whether he held the belief but it is not an additional requirement that his belief must be reasonable. The question is whether it is genuinely held. When once his actual state of mind as to knowledge or belief as to facts is established, the question whether his conduct was honest or dishonest is to be determined by the fact finder by applying the objective standards of ordinary decent people. There is no requirement that the defendant must appreciate that what he has done is by those standards dishonest. And so one can see um, why that would be potentially relevant in the, in the PAG um, LIBOR case. Um, the the um, bank said in PAG that none of the bank personnel uh, knew that they were making any representation as to LIBOR, and therefore they couldn't possibly be said to have intended to deceive PAG in that regard. But you can see from that formulation by the Court, by the court Appeal in, in PAG um, that there may be some more, um, more debate to be had in that respect. The fourth ingredient of a misrepresentation claim for uh, a LIBOR it is the question of reliance, which is up on the screen now. 
And this was a yet, on this roller coaster ride of jurisprudential thrills and spills, it's another interesting um, point that came out of the uh, Court of Appeal. Um, the question really here was, um, and again, although the, the, the Court of Appeal left open in PAG the question of reliance, the bank's case was that um, nobody at PAG had ever actively considered the question of LIBOR or any representation implied or otherwise as to um, its um, being manipulated or not. In other words, the bank's case was, well, it never crossed anybody at PAG's mind, and therefore how can they say that they relied upon it? To which the answer that, that, that PAG gave was that you, you, you test reliance um, by looking at the counterfactual, and you look at what PAG would have done had it known the true position. And in, in, in PAG's case, had PAG been told that LIBOR was being manipulated, it would not have gone on to transact contracts referable to that LIBOR benchmark. And so that there is, I think, arising from PAG, uh, an interesting question as to what sort of reliance you need in a case such as this, where by definition, an honest representee is not going actively to consider whether the benchmark is honest. It, he or she or it will assume that it is honest um, and will assume that they will be told if that is not the case. And that's actually the foundation for implying the representation in the first place, pursuant to Ms. Justice Coleman's helpful test. So if you, but by the time that you get to reliance, if you have endorsed, as the Court of Appeal did, the helpful test in Geese and Fife's to determine whether there is an implied representation, it, it, it must, uh, in my view, be strongly arguable that the counterfactual test set out in cases like Ross River and um, Parabola, uh, namely, what would the representative have done had they known the truth, is the answer to the question of reliance. And then I've set out, finally, the possible future applications. That This was um, heard as a test case um, of importance to the financial markets. Uh, clearly, the, the Court of Appeal's finding as to the representation is of some precedent value in relation to other cases concerning financial uh, market benchmarks. And you can see the other uh, areas in which those benchmarks are being um, uh, looked at. Oh, sorry. One of the advantages, obviously, for a misrepresentation case based upon fraud is that if the uh, claimant succeeds, then, they, then they're entitled to rescission as of right and have no, no need to prove loss, which is obviously one of the uh, very important issues um, in, in these cases. With that, um, I'll hand over for May to Ben to do the swaps. Thank you, Tim, um, and thank you all for coming. Anybody who's spent any time with barristers knows that the only thing worse than hearing them talk about their victories is hearing them talk about their defeats. Um, unfortunately, Tim and I don't have the luxury of any interesting victories, uh, so instead you're saddled hearing about a case uh, that we have now lost not once but twice. Um, and it's perhaps fitting that whereas Tim was talking uh, about an area in which the Court of Appeal has opened new possibilities in relation to the law on implied representations um, 10 years after the crash. I will be talking about an area where the Court of Appeal did precisely the opposite, namely put to bed the possibility of a middle way or crest sign claim in relation to financial product mis-selling. Um, the background... Uh, factually, PAG was in a position that was very common indeed in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Uh, in common with thousands of other bank counterparties, it had entered into interest rate derivatives between 2004 and early 2008. Um, and then when interest rates catastrophically collapsed in late 2008, it found, them so it found itself very much out of the money in the, on those derivatives. Um, it ultimately broke them in 2012, paying more than £11 million of break costs to get out of those derivatives in order to carry on with its business without the ongoing liabilities uh, to RBS. 
Uh, and it sought to say that before the crisis, those swaps had been missold to it. Now, the, the legal landscape. Generally and historically, there have been two big categories of mis-selling claims against banks available, both of which rest on really very well-established principles of law. Uh, first, you can have a straightforward misrepresentation or Headley Byrne misstatement type claim where you say that the bank simply misled you directly as to the content of the financial product you were buying. Uh, and secondly, you can say that the bank owed you an advisory duty uh, to actually give you advice as to the suitability of the particular financial product that you were entering into. But both categories of claim, as many claimants discovered after 2008, run into some fairly common problems. Uh, as to misrep or Headley Byrne type claims, the main problem is that it can often be very difficult, and indeed this was ultimately where the Court of Appeal came out on the facts of PAG, to identify a single misleading statement, even if overall the Court is satisfied that on the facts the counterparty came away from the selling process with a misleading impression about the content of the financial product they were buying. And obviously, banks do have well-planned sales procedures to make sure that their salesmen aren't directly making misrepresentations, and as such, that it's often very difficult to found such a claim. By contrast, advisory claims are also difficult, because even if in substance what the counterparty felt it was getting from the bank was advice as to the sort of interest rate derivative it should enter into, the carefully drafted terms and conditions of bank derivative contracts create a contractual estoppel that prevents the bringing of those sorts of claims. And so the question for claimants uh, in that environment is, is there a third way to ground these claims? Now, before turning to the crest sign heresy, uh, as the Court of Appeal seems to have uh, thought it was, it's worth saying something very briefly about the regulatory context. Obviously, the selling of derivatives is a very heavily regulated area, uh, and banks uh, are under all sorts of obligations uh, under the FCA rules. But successive attempts to uh, make those rules actionable in civil claims by, by various different routes have failed. So the first uh, thing that Swap's counterparties tried was to say that they were private persons within the meaning of Section 150 of FUSMA. Um, that failed before David Steele J in a case called Titan Steel Wheels, where he said private persons means individuals who are transacting with banks, not companies, um, however much they are in, in substance, one-man bans. Uh, secondly, uh, there was uh, a suggestion that banks might owe a common law duty that was coterminous with the FSA rules, and that was rejected by His Honour Judge Waxman QC, as he then was, and then the Court of Appeal in a case called Green and Rowley and RBS. Uh, and then finally, there was an attempt to say that the FCA and FSA rules were incorporated by reference into swaps contracts, that was an argument we ran in PAG that was unsuccessful at first instance and wasn't renewed on appeal. So looking to the FSA rules, sorry, the FCA rules, uh, as they now are, uh, isn't going to give you much quarter. So instead, claimants turned to uh, what is sometimes termed the mezzanine duty. And this is a term that was coined in a case called Crest Sign and Nat West. Um, the facts are fairly similar, in fact, to PAG's facts. Crest Sign was a small property company. Um, it was effectively a, a two-person company. It entered into a swap, and the swap went wrong, uh, and it sought to rescind it. And it alleged that the bank owed it what it called a mezzanine duty, i.e. a duty that falls somewhere between a pure duty not to mislead in a Headley, Byrne and Heller sense, and an advisory duty. And it was described uh, in Crestine and then in PAG by the Court of Appeal at paragraph 43 as a duty at common law to take reasonable care when providing information to ensure that such information is both accurate and fit for, pu fit for the purpose 
for which it is provided to enable the recipient to make a decision on an informed basis. Now, just pausing there, up until the word accurate, it's fairly clear that that is just no more than a statement of the law that we all learnt at law school in Headley, Byrne and Heller. Uh, if you say something, you have a duty not to make it misleading. That's not a complicated proposition. But where Crestsign arguably went further was the idea that banks owed a duty to make the information fit for purpose where that purpose was making an informed decision. Um, so to give a simple example uh, that was at the heart of the, in fact, the fact really of all of these swaps cases, if a bank salesman says, well, selling a swap, uh, obviously if this swap moves against you, you may choose to break it and you'll be able to do so. That is probably, although not certainly, misleading in the Headley, Byrne and Heller sense because it excludes the fact that there will be an enormous cost equivalent to the prospective disadvantage of staying in the swap to the counterparty. However, if you add, as RBS did in both PAG and Crestsign, but there may be a break cost, then on the facts of both of those cases, you escape liability uh, under Headley Byrne. What was being suggested in Crestsign, though, was that you might owe a duty to go further in those circumstances and give a sense of the scale or an indication of the scale of those break costs or possibly even some worked scenarios so that a counterparty might say, gosh, 11 million pounds, that's really rather a lot more money than I have. If those are the break costs, this sounds like it could be very bad indeed. Now, it's fair to say to... Uh, Tim Kerr QC, as he then was, now Kerr J, he was the judge in Crestsign, that it's not on rereading it, as I was doing yesterday evening, uh, entirely clear that he did endorse the formulation that was subsequently often referred to as the Crestsign duty. In fact, he said, well, the duty doesn't arise on these facts because Crestsign was just about sophisticated enough that the bank owed it no such duty. But nevertheless, this was a case that provoked a flurry of activity in the financial markets, and a number of claimants, including PAG, in fact, applied to amend their swaps claim pleadings to bring in an allegation of something akin to a crest sign duty. Now, it's important now to go back a little bit further uh, and look at the origins of crest sign, um, because the crest sign duty was said in, in that case. Uh, to derive from the judgment of Mr. Justice Mance, as he then was in Bankers' Trust and Damala. Um, and the way he put the point there, you'll see I've, I've underlined it. He said, in short, a bank negotiating and contracting with another party owes in the first instance no duty to explain the nature or effect of the proposed arrangement to that other party. So far, so ordinary. However, if the bank does give an explanation or tender advice, then it owes a duty to give that explanation or tender that advice fully, accurately and properly. How far that duty goes must once again depend on the precise nature of the circumstances and of the explanation or advice which is tendered. The debate that then arose in both Crestsign and PAG was exactly how far Mr Justice Mance intended to go in that statement. And in particular, I think really... What does fully accurately and properly mean? Does it go beyond Headley, Byrne and Heller? Um, but given that the uh, decision in Bankers Trust was surprisingly cited in only two or three cases between 1996 and 2014, there hadn't been a lot of examination of that point um, until the Court of Appeal looked at it in PAG. So what did the Court of Appeal say? Well, the essence of its decision is that it took us right back to basics and cast aside any suggestion that Crestsign might represent or offer a different form of liability for banks that didn't already exist and wasn't already well established uh, on existing principles of law. So of Crestsign, uh, it rejected the expression mezzanine duty. It said it was best avoided, in particular because it suggested that there might be a spectrum of different types of duty you might owe, uh, running from the, at the one end misrepresentation to the, at the other end advisory duty. And the Court of Appeal said, no, it's important to avoid any such suggestion. Um, it then 
uh, also went right the way back, in fact, uh, before Hedley, Byrne and Heller, to analyse the very basics of uh, liability arising from an assumption of responsibility in tort, um, and looked at cases like Capara and Dickman, um, and references to both the threefold and incremental test for where duties of care in tort are said to arise. And then it said, the Hedley Byrne common law duty of care not to misstate is then merely one example of a more general principle that a defendant's assumption of responsibility may give rise to a duty of care, giving rise to pure economic loss, either in relation to a particular transaction or a continuing relationship, the existence of the duty and its extent being dependent on the particular facts. Now, in some ways, the Court of Appeal has possibly made matters even worse for claimants uh, against banks uh, than Bankers' Trust suggested, because on the face of Bankers' Trust, it looks like once you speak, you then owe a duty to make that explanation full, accurate, and proper. But in fact, what the Court of Appeal seems to be saying in uh, paragraph 63 and the preceding paragraphs is it's possible that for a sufficiently sophisticated counterparty, a bank may owe no duty at all because it simply wouldn't arise if you look at very basic Capara and Dickman, Headley Byrne type principles. There may be no duty even if there is an inaccurate statement made. So, uh, briefly on the question which was castigated by the banks as heretical in the course of the submissions in PAG um, of whether or not there is a duty to speak, the Court of Appeal does accept that there could be a duty to speak in a sufficiently extreme case, um, referring to Cornish and Midland Bank. Um, that's a, a 1960s case uh, in which the bank didn't say anything at all. It simply proffered a mortgage to a husband and wife who would be jointly liable for it and failed to explain uh, in the course of selling the mortgage uh, to the wife that uh, she would be liable, or rather the, the security would attach to unlimited future borrowings by her husband. Um, and the Court of Appeal endorsed that decision and said, well, those facts are sufficiently extreme um, that there, there might be a duty to speak because, if you like, the, the consequences are so dire. Um, but on Perg's facts, both of the pieces of information that it said ought to have been given to it as a swaps counterparty, and indeed swaps counterparties more generally, um, didn't pass the test for there being a duty to speak. Uh, they were what's called the clue, uh, perhaps a particularly unfortunate name for a piece of information said to expose uh, exactly how a bank is viewing a particular transaction. Uh, and you can obviously imagine the moment in cross-examination uh, in PAG where the bank salesman referred to the clue and nobody in the courtroom knew what it was. Uh, but it stands, in fact, for credit limit utilisation. And it is, if you like, the bank's internal view of how much credit it has to extend to a counterparty in order to sell it a particular swap. And secondly, worked scenarios of break costs uh, that would arise under different interest rates. Uh, the Court of Appeal said neither of those is a fair, just and reasonable thing to impose on a bank um, as in, in the ordinary course. Um, although it is worth saying that uh, banks do now, and this was uh, in evidence in PAG, in fact, as a matter of course, provide the latter. So if you try and enter an, into an interest rate derivative now, um, the bank will give you worked break cost scenarios. So where does that leave us and how might we apply it in future? Uh, the key point, uh, it seems to me, really, is the revival of bankers' trust and the idea that there can be a duty once banks speak to give full, accurate and proper explanations. And that will then give rise to two questions um, that lawyers have to think about. First, does a banker's trust duty arise? Does, does the bank's conduct mean it acquires a duty of care to its counterparty? Um, and secondly, if it has then gone on to offer something of an explanation of a product, was that explanation full and accurate? But it's particularly important to remember that in light of the Court of Appeal's clarification that the crest sign duty is really no more than an aspect of Hedley, Byrne and Heller, the ordinary law on misrepresentation, it's going to be central to identify and then plead specific statements which are said either to in themselves be misleading or to make the bank's overall explanation misleading, because that will be the key battleground in future cases. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass over to Craig uh, to move on to a different subject altogether.
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my talk is about a situation that has arisen in a number of major cases since the financial crisis. Uh, the normal fact, pattern of facts are these. A bank sells a product to an investor. It's often a complex and exceptionally expensive derivative. In due course, the financial crisis hits and the product loses most or all of its value. It then turns out that someone else involved in the transaction has been up to no good. They could be an advisor to the investor or a nominally independent intermediary. My slides. Uh, the usual fact pattern is that when the transaction is investigated closely, it turns out the intermediary was engaged in paying bribes or, if they were an advisor, failing to advise the investor honestly, or, or perhaps both. Uh, now, the investor could obviously sue the intermediary. That's easy. But the intermediary often won't have the money to pay out, uh, and in any case, the investor would still be on the hook for the transaction. So their main objective will usually be to get out of the deal altogether. Uh, how, then, can the investor seek to escape the transaction in a claim against the bank? Now, this was the situation that arose in the long-running case uh, of UBS and Communale Wasserwerk Leipzig, uh, a case that was, I think, issued in 2010 before anyone realized that there was any fraud at all, and finally finished in the Court of Appeal in, in October 2017. Um, now, I'll, I'll spare you my German pronunciation by calling the defendant KWL. Um, UBS sold $400 million of complex derivatives to KWL. Now, these were known as uh, single tranche collateralized debt obligations, or STCDOs. Uh, and if they sound complicated, that's because they were. Uh, mercifully, the details of this transaction don't matter, I think, for my talk. Uh, Simon Salzedo has that uh, to explain and look forward to in a moment. Um, the principles considered by the Court of Appeal could apply to any transaction. Now, KWL, uh, as you can see up here, was the Leipzig water board uh, and not a well-known expert in credit derivatives. Uh, but they were advised by independent financial advisors who were, as it turns out, somewhat misleadingly called value partners. Uh, they advised to do the deal. The deal was done. Um, and from 2007 onwards, the STCDOs performed appallingly, uh, even by the standards of transactions uh, entered into prior to that period. They sustained a total loss. Uh, after the STCDOs collapsed, investigations brought to light two important facts. First, value partners had paid bribes to one of KWL's two managing agents, uh, Mr. Uh, managing directors, I should say, uh, Mr. Klaus Heininger. Uh, he was paid $3 million in cash to encourage him to do the deal. Uh, and secondly, UBS and Value Partners had been involved in a separate uh, dishonest arrangement whereby Value Partners was to deliver uh, captive clients, that's what they were called, to UBS, uh, to UBS and Value Partners' mutual benefit. Uh, and that was in uh, clear breach of value partners' duties to KWL. <coughs> now, UBS obviously knew about the captive client arrangement. They knew about that part of the fraud. But they didn't know about the bribes. Uh, and this turned UBS and KWL into something of a test case for what exactly an investor must show if they want to escape a transaction procured by a corrupt intermediary. Uh, and courtesy of UBS's appeal, uh, it was considered at a relatively high level. Now, I'd flag at the outset that, on the facts, Value Partners was KWL's agent, uh, and that's important to some of the points we'll look at. Um, but significant elements of the Court of Appeals analysis apply even if the intermediary was acting independently, uh, and that is another fact pattern that's arisen in a number of major pieces of litigation. So the Court of Appeals decision uh, is of broad significance. So what did the Court of Appeal decide? Um, KWL sought to rescind the STCDOs uh, to the extent it entered into them directly with UBS. Uh, and the Court of Appeal considered three ways in which this might be achieved. Um, first, KWL might show that Value Partners was actually acting as UBS's agent as well as its agent. Uh, second, KWL might show that UBS knew about Value Partners' conflict of interest arising from the client scheme, the captive client scheme, and on that basis seek rescission on that ground. Uh, and third, and breaking new ground, the majority of the Court of Appeal held that UBS, UBS might be responsible for the bribery, despite not knowing about it, on the basis that UBS's involvement in its own captive client scheme meant that its conscience was affected 
by value partners broader fraud. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that has a name as a claim yet. I've called it unconscionability, um, but I think that is new uh, and something that hasn't arisen before. Uh, it's the most controversial part of the case, uh, and as we'll see, it provoked a vigorous dissent from Lady Justice Gloucester, who, who thought this was a bad idea. Uh, now, for completeness, uh, I should mention there are also damages claims that are available in this context, um, but they might well be an, an, inadequ an inadequate remedy um, if you cannot prove actual loss. Um, for example, if, if the uh, investor would have entered into a similarly bad but honest deal elsewhere. Um, so the focus in KWL, uh, and certainly the focus today, is on rescission. So turning to the first of the Court of Appeals uh, headings, agency, uh, was the intermediary actually the agent of the bank? Now, the first thing to note, as I've put in my title of this slide, is that this argument, if it succeeds, means you can set aside the transaction even if the bank knows nothing about the fraud. Uh, and it's potentially the only argument open to you uh, if you are the investor and the bank doesn't know about the fraud. Nonetheless, they will still be responsible for the fraud uh, if the intermediary is the bank's agent uh, and the wrongdoing takes place within the scope of that agency. Uh, and this argument worked at first instance in KWL. We, we won on this point. Um, Stephen Mills, uh, Mr. Justice Mills, found that UBS had appointed value partners as its agent for securing business um, from value partners' clients. The bribe was paid to achieve this objective, and therefore UBS were on the hook for the bribe. Uh, the Court of Appeal uh, overturned that aspect of the decision uh, on the facts. Uh, but in doing so, it provided important guidance on when an agency relationship will arise in cases like this. Now, they noted a, the Court of Appeal noted a lot of points. I, I've highlighted five, uh, which I'll run through briefly. First, the party's labels for their relationship will not be decisive. So the bank and the intermediary can agree that there is no agency relationship. That's not going to be the end of the matter. Uh, if their agency, if their relationship, I should say, is as, as a matter of substance, one of agency, that's what the law will deem it to be. So often there'll be a contract saying one party doesn't act as the other party's agent. It's still well worth looking at this argument. Uh, but second, it, it may well be important that the intermediary is also the agent of the investor. And this was certainly important in UBS and KWL, where value partners, as we've seen, uh, were KWL's supposed advisor. Uh, and that relationship, that pre-existing relationship, was inconsistent with any honest agency between UBS and value partners. Uh, and the Court of Appeal thought that was a factor pointing against an agency relationship arising. Uh, the third factor on the list is that if the uh, agent does not purport to represent the principal in dealings with the parties, that will, again, point against an agency relationship. So if the nature of the relationship is that it must be kept secret, as will often be the case if it is in some way dishonest, um, then that will tend to mean that the relationship, again, is not one of agency. Um, fourth, the uh, relevance of a fiduciary relationship. Now, an agency relationship is normally a fiduciary one. So if the intermediary is not the bank's fiduciary, that will tend to mean that the relationship, again, is not one of agency. But that can't be taken too far. The Court of Appeal noted that if the only reason that the parties were not in a fiduciary relationship is that the relationship was improper, then the absence of a fiduciary relationship would not be conclusive on the facts. So if the agency relationship, um, or rather, if the relationship has been agreed uh, in circumstances where it shouldn't have been, and therefore is not fiduciary, that doesn't mean that you're closed out of running this argument. Uh, now fifth though, and perhaps most importantly, uh, the Court of Appeal cautioned that an agency relationship should only arise if it's the best explanation of the facts. So if the most obvious explanation for the party's dealings is that the bank and intermediary are each pursuing their own interests, perhaps in concert, but not one on behalf of the other, then the courts will not force that relationship into the straitjacket of agency. And again, this was clearly an important factor in UBS and KWL, uh, where there was no need, the Court of Appeal found, to find value partners with UBS's agent to explain the captive client scheme. Now, pulling those points together, this, suggests, this decision suggests that the courts are reluctant to find an agency relationship between a bank and an intermediary where the intermediary already has a pre-existing role in the transaction. 
So if they're already there as an advisor to the investor, an agency relationship will be necessarily improper and therefore is unlikely to arise. But the argument may have more force where the intermediary solely acts uh, to represent, in some sense, the bank. Now, this argument might well arise in the context of introducing brokers, and this is a point that's been canvassed in a few cases, where they secure introductions for a bank to potential investors and seek to persuade those investors to buy the bank's products. But then they turn out, perhaps unknown to the bank, to do this by engaging in corrupt activity, um, such as paying bribes. Now, in those circumstances, uh, it may well be the case that an agency relationship arises, uh, and that might be the best and most credible argument open to an investor who seeks to set aside the deal. So agency was the, the first ground of challenge the Court of Appeal considered. Um, the second ground uh, concerned knowledge. And here the argument is that the bank knows uh, that the investor's agent is operating under a conflict of interest. Now, on the facts of UBS and KWL, Value Partners itself was the relevant party operating under a conflict of interest because it owed duties to KWL, which it was breaching. Uh, but the same point can arise with an independent intermediary. So if a third party intermediary, not acting as agent for anybody, pays a bribe to the director of an investor and the bank knows about that, doesn't need to have assisted it, might just know about it, uh, then the bank will know that the director is operating under a conflict of interest. And therefore, it follows that the transaction can be rescinded as against the bank, even though it has done nothing more than be aware of that payment. Um, and again, therefore, it needs to be very cautious. The bank needs to be very cautious if it becomes aware of that type of activity. Now, what does knowledge mean in this context? Uh, knowledge means knowledge. It means actual knowledge or willful blindness. Negligence isn't enough. Suspicions aren't enough. It doesn't matter if the bank should have realized if it did not in fact realize what was going on. And the um, Court of Appeal followed in that regard, Mr. Justice Millet, as he then was, uh, his decision in Ludicross and South End United Football Club. And as you can see from the quote there, parties to negotiations do not need to act reasonably, and they only need to act honestly. Now, so far, that's relatively simple, but um, more difficult situations can and did arise uh, in KWL. Um, and I, I've looked at three of them here. Uh, first, what if the bank knows about the conflict um, but mistakenly thinks it will be disclosed? Now, in Logicross, Mr. Justice Millett suggested that this was a hazardous course and that a party entering into a deal in these circumstances took the risk of non-disclosure. Now, the Court of Appeal, I think, appeared to agree with this, the majority anyway, um, but it is not entirely clear whether they thought knowledge in those circumstances would be enough. It might be also necessary to assist the breach. So the point may be open, but in any event, the safe course, if you're a bank that knows of a conflict, is to make sure that disclosure is made. And if that hasn't happened and you're the investor, you may well have a good claim there for rescission. Uh, a second point that arose um, uh, near the bottom of the slide there is whether well, any breach of fiduciary duty is enough, or do you need to show bribery? Uh, and the short answer is, uh, it doesn't matter what type of breach it is. If you, the bank, know of a breach of fiduciary duty, you are potentially vulnerable to rescission. But the um, slightly longer answer is that it might matter when it comes to when the question arises of whether the court should, in the exercise of its discretion, grant rescission. Because um, if I can put it this way, a minor breach of fiduciary duty will not always result in rescission. Uh, if, uh, for example, the court decides it's disproportionate, um, whereas a more serious breach, such as bribery, almost invariably will justify rescission. So you can run the argument for any breach of fiduciary duty, but it won't necessarily get you rescission uh, unless it's a serious breach. Um, now, the third point um, is how this head of claim interacts with another uh, fun and rather complicated area of law to do with attribution of knowledge of directors uh, to uh, claimants. Uh, and in summary, UBS sought to argue that KWL's director knew about value partners' bribery. And this knowledge was attributable to KWL. And that meant that KWL had consented to having a corrupt agent. And therefore, UBS's own fraud in relation to the captive client scheme didn't really matter. Um, now, that sounds a little bit bald. Uh, the Court of Appeal agreed, at least the majority agreed, uh, and said this was an entirely artificial theory. Uh, they characterized value partners' conduct as giving rise to a single 
multi-party fraud, of which both UBS, KWL's director, and value partners were participants, albeit that they were involved in different parts. And this meant, the Court of Appeal said, that KWL's director's knowledge of part of the fraud couldn't be attributed to KWL in relation to a claim against UBS arising from the other part of the fraud. Uh, now, this extended, uh, I think, the Supreme Court's decision in Bilter against Nazir, um, where it had been held that uh, to prevent attribution, um, it may be necessary to know about the director's wrongdoing. Um, it seems it's now sufficient that the uh, defendant to, to the claim for rescission is involved in a fraudulent scheme as a whole in relation to the transaction, even if it didn't know about the particular director's particular wrongdoing. Uh, provided they're involved in the larger scheme, that will prevent attribution of the director's knowledge. And, and taking the point more generally, the, the majority in the Court of Appeal was obviously highly hostile to technical arguments based on attribution of knowledge where a bank had knowingly participated in a fraudulent scheme. Uh, and this attitude was seen still more clearly in the third part of the decision, dealing with the challenge based on unconscionability, to which we now turn. Um, now, this is, this is brand new, I think, um, or at least it was when the decision came out. Uh, the Court of Appeal majority broke new ground. Now, para I've put the quote up there, but paraphrasing this, what the majority is saying is that if a party secretly and dishonestly assists an investor agent in committing one breach of duty, and then it turns out that the agent also sought to promote the deal by further, potentially worse breaches of duty, then even though uh, the bank was not aware of those further breaches, they'll still be held responsible for them. The rationale for that, the Court of Appeal said, is that once a party engages in dishonest assistance, its conscience is affected by all the wrongdoing that's committed and not just the wrongdoing that it knew about. So in effect, once you start down the road of engaging in dishonest assistance, you're sub subject to a form of strict liability, uh, at least as regards claims for rescission. Uh, and this is important because, as we've already touched on, certain types of breach are worse than others when it comes to rescission, and rescission might well be available for a breach you didn't know about, say bribery, but not be available for the breach you did know about. Now this uh, provoked a, a very robust dissenting judgment from Lady Justice Gloucester. Um, she described it uh, as imposing the moral standards of the vicarage uh, on commercial transactions. Uh, and warming to her theme, and in case anyone had missed the point, uh, Furler said that it was commercially and practically unworkable and commercially unreal. Um, now, the majority, uh, having read this criticism in draft, rejected it uh, and said there was nothing uncommercial at all uh, in the conclusion they had reached. Uh, and then, uh, as you can see in the quote there, uh, effectively restated their conclusion and the approach they suggested. Now, so, so who's right on this? Um, well, I, I think it's perhaps fair to say um, that the language of conscience and unconscionability isn't ideal. Now, this stems, of course, from the fact that this is an equitable remedy rescission. Um, so that obviously explains why people are talking in terms of conscience. But it, it suggests the court, or may suggest, the court is required to engage in some form of subjective evaluation of the bank's conduct. Uh, and there would be obvious scope for uncertainty in an assessment of that type. But I would suggest that's not what the majority are actually saying. Uh, at the heart of the majority judgment is a much simpler proposition, uh, that if you engage in dishonest assistance to promote a transaction via a breach of fiduciary duty, and your co-conspirator goes beyond what you expected them to do and does something even worse, uh, then you're going to be on the hook for that wrongdoing. Um, it, it, in effect, says once you pass through the gates of dishonesty, you are responsible for everything you find there. Uh, and, and I think that that is, so far as it goes, a perfectly defensible position. It seems justified by the law's policy of deterring involvement in corrupt activity. And you see that across this area of law. It's why you don't need to show causation in a case procured by bribery. You can simply rescind the deal. Um, and it really reflects the principle that there's no such thing when it comes to this area of law in being half dishonest or partially dishonest. Uh, when, once you engage in dishonesty, you take the risk that your accomplice goes further, uh, and once you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, or, or 400 million, as the case may be. Uh, so for this reason, I think that the majority's reasoning is likely to be upheld. Now finally, I've, I've touched briefly on, on damages. It shouldn't be overlooked. In an appropriate case, these might well 
be an appropriate alternative remedy. But you must, of course, show actual loss, as, as was touched on, I think, in the previous talk and, and by me earlier in this talk. Um, but you may be forced to pursue damages if rescission isn't available, for example, because of the intervention of third-party rights or failure to give counter-restitution or any of the other bars to rescission. So it would be safer to include that as an alternative argument. Um, and the final point on this slide is that there is a line of law that says that you can always sue a party responsible for the bribe for the amount of that bribe, uh, effectively on the legal fiction that the price you paid for the deal has been inflated by at least the amount of the bribe. Uh, and that's always worth chucking into any claim in this area as well. If all else fails, you're likely at least to get that. But the focus of UBS and KWL is on rescission. Uh, and summarizing the talk, I think there's two key points to take away. First, it's difficult to force a dishonest arrangement into an agency analysis, particularly where the intermediary already acts as the investor's agent. But second, uh, the law on rescission when a party is aware of a conflict of interest, or still worse, participates in it, is comparatively generous. And once you cross the threshold into dishonest conduct, the courts are likely to give short shrift to any attempt to escape liability on the basis you did not know the full extent of what was going on. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, I'm going to speak on something legally completely different, legally in fact much simpler, but arising from the same case, CBS and KWL. I'm going to take the hazardous course of trying to move this up here so I can see my slides. Um, so fund management negligence also arose in this case. Uh, as Craig has told you, UBS sued KWL on these complicated derivatives for about $400 million. And for the reasons Craig has explained, the uh, High Court and the Court of Appeal held that the uh, CDOs had in fact been validly rescinded so there was no liability under them. Uh, KWL had another string to its bow, however, namely that if the C STCDOs had been valid, then uh, KWL made a claim over against another UBS entity, UBS Global Asset Management UK Limited, for negligent portfolio management. And this claim also succeeded in full. So if the STCDOs had been valid, the whole of the loss would have been paid by the uh, asset management branch of UBS. Uh, now, as Craig uh, mentioned, I have to explain the transaction in order to explain the negligence. That's supposed to be a picture of wet towels. Um, so what is an STCDO? The basic components of an STCDO are CDSs, which many of you will immediately recall, are credit default swaps, which are effectively um, insurance policies on individual credits. You can think of them as insurance policies on particular companies. Uh, in reality, they're in particular obligations. There'll be issues of notes and that kind of thing. So you've got a, a series of these individual credit default swaps, um, and you get a load of them, 100 or 150, and you visualize them in a tower, as you see on the right-hand side, of the screen, um, and the tower is the CDO. If one of them defaults, well, if you've got 100, then that's 1%. Uh, and there may be a recovery on the particular note issue in question, in which case, let's say, investors lose 80%. Well, in that case, you've got a 0.8% of the whole CDO has defaulted. And you visualize the tower uh, with whichever one happens to be first to default at the bottom. So you don't actually know at the start, what, what order they're in in the tower, that depends how they default. Um, and the investor, in this case KWL, has a tranche of this CDO, which means that if the defaults reach the level of their tranche, if enough of these individual CDSs uh, go bad over the term of the instrument, which is over several years, then um, KWL starts paying out. Um, so, in effect, KWL is selling to UBS credit insurance on a basket of entities or note issues, um, whatever they might be, uh, and they're selling it on that little bit which happens to default uh, at the right bit of the tower. 
And in this particular case, KWL's tranches were right down near the bottom at about 3.5%. They had a width of 1.5%. And what that means is, if 3.5% of all of these CDSs default over the term of the instrument, KWL starts paying some of the 400 million. If you reach a total of 5% of defaulted over the whole term of the instrument, then the whole 400 million is payable. It's actually more complicated than that, but that is, uh, I think, enough um, to be going on with. Okay, so KWL were taking an enormous risk. It was justified in various ways, which probably don't matter for the purpose of my talk. Um, and as you know from Craig's talk, uh, it was corruptly induced and therefore, in the end, set aside. Um, now, let's go back and assume that the transaction does, uh, it was valid. As well as selling the STCDO as a sensible risk mitigation strategy for a water contractor, UBS also sold to KWL the idea that it would also be good to have um, a portfolio manager to manage and mitigate the risks that it faced under the STCDO. And uh, that manager would be UBS Global Asset Management UK Limited. For a further modest uh, fee, or for a modest fee, um, of $7.5 million, the UBS Global Asset Management would keep an eye on the reference entities that were within the CDO, that's the 100 or 150 entities whose credit was being insured, um, and if they started looking like their credit might be in trouble, it would swap them out for something better. Sounds good. Um, and I'm just about to say something important, which is not actually on the slide, which is there was, of course, a contract underlying this idea, a contract, a portfolio management agreement, uh, in which UBS GAM promised to uh, observe the ordinary duty of care and also made it clear that they were looking after the interests of KWL as discretionary managers and also said that they would observe their own um, uh, usual standards and practices of portfolio management. Um, and as well as the contract, there was also a pitch book in which they explained that the way they did this was to have a conservative, diversified set of um, risks in the portfolio to avoid building up a concentrated risk, and that when they saw one getting into trouble, one of these CDSs looking like it might possibly go bad, they would have an early exit strategy. So all of that was part of the sales pitch. Um, okay. The terms, of course, it isn't as straightforward as that. They can't just swap out any old credit because it looks like it's going bad. Otherwise, the whole game would be far too easy and there'd be no real risk. Uh, so there was a price. If the, now, the, these uh, credit default swaps were traded in the market. There was a market for them. So there were visible prices for them. Um, and if you swapped out a, a, a credit which had a, a higher market value on it, that's to say the market thought it was more likely to go bad, for one that had a lower market value, less risky, um, there was a price to be paid for that within the STCDO structure, either by shifting the tranche downwards from 3.5% to 3.4%, whatever it might be, or um, by paying out cash from a, a, a fund for that purpose. On the other hand, if it's the other way around, if you put into the the tower, a, um, a swap which, which the market thought was more risky, then you would actually get cash into your fund or you'd be able to move your subordination, your, your level on the tower upwards. So in theory, what the manager was supposed to do, what the portfolio manager had to do was quite a skilled job. The portfolio manager had to look at the spreads in the market, work out whether there was a real risk of default and whether the spreads were good value in terms of um, this equation with money going in and out of the, um, of the structure. The manager's only purpose as representing KWL's interest was to ensure that defaults never reach that 3.5% level. Okay, so that was what they should have been doing, making an in a difficult evaluation at every stage as to what needed to be taken out, what you might put in that would, be, uh, that would prevent defaults ever reaching KWL's level, after taking into account the level moving up and down because of your swaps um, and the cash that you might have available to buy in less risky uh, risks in the future. That was what they should have been doing. And now, as I put it on the slide, for something completely different, what they were doing. Um, in practice, the, the manager, Mr. Datani, 
who, interestingly enough, had never really done anything much like this before, he understood that what his task was was to maintain the rating of the tranche. Um, and as uh, anyone who's been involved in these things will, will know, a key element of the uh, issues that arose in the financial crisis, which I don't think has, has had a mention yet today, um, was the rating agencies keeping up high ratings for dubious investments. Um, and of course, uh, uh, and in the case of the tranche, there was something defined in the contract called the Moody's metric, which was a way of effectively translating the ratings of the 100 or 150 credit default swaps into a single figure which related to the tranche. Um, and the Moody's metric had various roles in the contract, but none of them really fundamental. Um, now, as the crisis developed, as you um, may well know, the market spreads on the credits of some entities and risks, such as monoline insurers, Icelandic banks, and so on, started to go very wide in the jargon. That's to say the market started rating those risks as much more risky. However, the ratings agencies were much slower to react to those changes. And, and they, they made a virtue of it. They said, we're not volatile like the markets. We don't change our rating every, every five minutes. Um, and of course, in fact, in the run-up to the crisis, things like monolines in particular and, and, and banks like Lehman's and so on retained their AAA ratings or retained their other very high ratings right up to the end. And what that meant was that a manager like Mr. Datani of UBS GAM, who thought his job was to maintain the rating of the tranche, would find it beneficial to put into the, into the CDO tower risks which the market were rating more and more risky, but which the rating agency had not yet responded to. Because of the equation I explained to you earlier, that if you put in a more risky credit, you're entitled to move the subordination up, move the tranche up the tower, or get money in that you can later use to buy more subordination and that kind of thing. So on the face of it, a more risky credit is a good idea as long as you can um, do it where the ratings remain stable. So Mr. Dutani thought he was playing a very clever game of arbitraging between the market spreads and the ratings. Um, and in a sense, from minute to minute, it could look like quite a clever game because he was getting money in, improving the subordination, but all the time, of course, packing in ever more of the very worst entities as the crisis approached because the market could see they were risky, which is why they were so attractive to Mr. Tatani. So the result was these portfolios became packed with monolines, Icelandic banks, Kazakh banks even, uh, all kinds of um, uh, odd uh, stuff, which of course were all also highly re uh, related to each other in terms of their risk. Because uh, as you know, at what became increasingly clear to the markets was that there was a very strong correlation between the risks being faced by monoline insurers, some of the US banks and so on, uh, a lot of it concentrated on US subprime investments uh, and so on. Um, so that's what happened. That's why they all defaulted and the whole 400 million became due. Now, UBS GAM said, we were not negligent because, first of all, perfectly reasonable to follow the rating agencies. They were ostensibly measuring the risk of these things. They were very, um, uh, very authoritative measure of risk. We followed that. What's wrong with that? One thing they said. Another thing they said was, um, nobody predicted the crisis. Nobody was expecting it. Uh, everyone in this business thought that the financial industry was good and that the market as a whole in its CDS ratings was being unduly pessimistic. Um, and uh, so they also said, um, generally speaking, the whole of the portfolio management industry in this kind of portfolio of credit swaps, they all, they all, they all did badly too. Um, we were just doing what everyone else was doing, so we can't be negligent. That was all rejected on the facts, a trial, uh, and by, in fact, on this point, a unanimous court of appeal, even Lady Justice Gloucester was uh, not prepared to overturn Mr. Justice Mayles on the question of negligence. Um, and uh, the essential point, uh, and I said it was an important point that wasn't on the slide, was the contract. It, it was clear that what uh, UBS GAM was supposed to be doing was looking after the interests of KWL, its client. The interest of KWL in this instrument did not depend 
on the clever arbitrage game. The interest of KWL, this instrument, was only one thing. It was to stop defaults reaching the, um, the relevant level where it would start paying. Uh, and UBS Gamma effectively forgot that by playing this uh, uh, ratings arbitrage game. Secondly, UBS, uh, as with many other participants in the industry at the time, paid no attention to the fact that the risks were not independent of each other and that what it was doing was actually correlating risks, becoming ever more concentrated, so that if one went, it was highly likely that five or six would go, leading to defaulting uh, KWL's tranches. Um, and finally, they did not follow the sales pitch in their pitch book. Having said they'd follow their own procedures uh, and standards, they didn't do it. Um, they didn't follow an early exit strategy, they didn't follow a diversification strategy and so on. Instead, they went on this um, ratings arbitrage game. Um, now, I said it was legally rather simpler. There's, there's one point of law I'm going to come to. But rather oddly, and this is why I thought it might be worth talking about this topic at all, um, there have, don't seem to have been any cases on discretionary portfolio fund management that have actually reached a decision. Um, there was a mass of publicity around the Unilever a Mercury Asset Management case in 2001, where a, a fund manager who was seen as a superstar was cross-examined by a, a barrister who was perhaps seen similarly in the barrister world, Mr. Jonathan Sumption, as he then was, um, and, and loads of publicity, but um, it settled uh, shortly after this cross-examination. Um, and that's about it. No, no other decisions in this kind of negligence. Um, uh, the legal interest, the bit that was perhaps most difficult, arises in relation to causation and loss. Um, and this case illustrates something which was perhaps made clear, most clear in a case called Parabola, which I, I put the detail on the slide, which is that you have to separate out two, two questions which are often wrongly run together. First of all, did the negligence cause any loss? And that's a sort of straightforward balance of probabilities question, yes or no. And the judge decided on all the evidence, did it cause any loss, yes or no? Secondly, quite a different kind of question, what's the proper assessment of the quantum of that loss? Um, and that's the question in relation to which that well-known principle that the fact it's difficult won't deter the court from doing it comes into play. Um, and, uh, the and so the answer to the first question was, yes, of course it caused loss. This negligent approach meant the losses were higher than they would have been. Assessing the loss, much, much more difficult because you've got the whole universe of CDSs that a, that a manager might have chosen from. How on earth do you decide what a competent manager would have done? Um, on the facts, the judge held that uh, any competent manager would have incurred zero losses for KWL. Pre um, and, and he did that mainly by reference to a comparison with what would have happened if there'd been no management at all. If there'd been no management, if you just had the original 100 or 150 entities in each of these instruments, um, only there would have been one small loss on, on one part of it. Uh, and the judge held that any competent manager would have taken out that particular credit, therefore leading to no loss. So he's effectively saying UBS are held to the standard that they should have done better than having no management at all. Um, now, whether that, was, whether that was right or not was the subject of dissent in the Court of Appeal. Lady Justice Gloucester said that the judge had, um, had simply wrongly taken that as the comparator, and that wasn't fair, and that it might be that, it, that even a competent manager might have done worse than having no manager at all. Um, the majority said that the judge's decision was actually a bit more sophisticated than that, and he'd understood that the real question was what, could any, what would any competent manager have achieved, um, but that was the best evidence available to him, and they set out the other evidence which the judge hadn't, because the ju judge dealt with this whole area very, very shortly because it didn't matter because he was setting aside the transactions. The Court of Appeal, oddly enough, had to deal with it in a bit more length to explain why the judge had perfectly good reasons for coming to the conclusion that any competent manager would have achieved at no loss at all. Um, there was one point of law, um, which we've just about got time for, uh, w which was this. Um, UBS said that they, they cited Balitho, which you may remember is a medical negligence case in the House of Lords, um, a, about a doctor who didn't turn up. And if they had turned up, they would have done a procedure called intubation, which would have uh, saved the problem from arising. Uh, and they said, following uh, Balitho, the question on loss 
was not what a competent manager would have achieved, but what Mr. Dottani would have achieved if he had not committed the established acts of negligence. And they said, Mr. Dottani loved financial entities. He would have basically done the same as he did, even if he'd not played the silly ratings game or if you cut out some of the other specific acts of negligence. And so probably he would have made most of the same losses because the financials would still have got into trouble when the crisis hit. And there are two answers to that in the Court of Appeal judgment. And this, I think, is of a, a relatively wide significance in the way that professional negligence claims are put. Um, the first is that Balitho is, not, is a decision only about causation. It's not about assessment of loss. Um, what Mr. Dottani himself would have done is not relevant to the judge's assessment of loss. And I think that's something that may not have been uh, fully understood uh, by, by everyone before. So that's a significant point. And they also made the point, citing a, an earlier Court of Appeal decision, that even on causation, the Belitho question, what would the negligent professional have done, is not always the relevant question. In effect, that question only arises in quite a specific circumstance, which is to say where there's a particular negligent error in Belitho not turning up at all. If you correct that negligent error, you've then got a choice of non-negligent options. In Belitho, it was you could intubate or not intubate, and both of those were non-negligent. They both were supported by a responsible body of medical opinion. Um, and if you've got that situation, where you've got a negligent action by the particular individual, which uh, you can cut out, and you're then faced with a choice of non-negligent options, that's the time when the Belitho question is relevant. Would that professional have done it or not? Now, in medical negligence, that kind of thing may arise reasonably often. There may be genuine choice of non-negligent options. In financial negligence, it probably happens rather less often that you've got a real choice of non-negligent options, although fund management might be an area where you do, but you'd have to say what they are. So that's interesting as well. Um, this is not a picture of uh, the refreshments you are about to be offered. This is a picture of takeaways. The takeaways from my talk are these. Um, Fund management negligence it, dis, for a discretionary portfolio it is a realistic claim, even though there don't seem to be any in the books. The, the lack of precedence in the books does not indicate that there's some magical defence. There is not. Um, discretionary management is not immune from a negligence claim. The contract is vital in such claims. Very important to understand what actually interest was the discretionary manager serving and what standard did they promise to perform at. The most difficult aspect for a claimant may well be proving loss. It can be a big uh, challenge. How to prove what the proper comparison is, what any competent fund manager would have achieved, can be very difficult. But on the other hand, at trial, uh, uh, as you know, if you have a situation where the claim is a good one, the management has been appallingly negligent, there may be a following wind on areas where the judge has not a discretion, but a wide range of possible assessments, and where the judge makes a sensible assessment on which there is evidence, the Court of Appeal should not interfere with it, as they did not in that case. Thank you very much uh, for listening and staying awake till nearly half past five. Well, could I thank you all for coming uh, and invite you to join me in thanking the speakers who I hope have made your visit here very well worthwhile. And if that's not enough, when you go down the stairs and turn left, you'll find there are some refreshments on offer in the bar.